Welcome to the Further Light Podcast, presented by Wisconsin Freemasonry, helping you accomplish your Masonic goals through education and more light. And now, I present to you, Brother Chris Ludke. Listeners, scholars, brothers, this is Brother Chris Lee and today I want to explore a Masonic story. And it's not just a Masonic story. In fact, you could argue that the Masons involved aren't necessarily the main characters. And yet, it shows an element of character, an element of who Masons can be, who they've been in the past. And I'm going to be looking specifically at two local lodges primarily at Waukesha 37 in Wisconsin, but also we'll be touching on Racine, uh, at the time, Bell City 18. What I'm looking at is the Josh Glover escape. Joshua Glover was a slave, and this is all happening before the Civil War. This is one of those situations where I want to look at the people involved. I want you to understand the risks they were taking and understand that while Masonry is not directly involved, I would argue that the teachings of Masonry are that these people became Masons for a reason and similar reasons to why they will be involved in this escape. So let's start by introducing Joshua Glover. He's enslaved initially in St. Louis, Missouri. As a young man, uh, he goes ahead and seeks freedom in Wisconsin, only to be recaptured after a friend betrays him. He's actually recaptured in Racine County and brought to Milwaukee. Now, defying the Fugitive Slave Act, a man by the name of Sherman Booth and other abolitionists will help Joshua escape from jail and then escape via the Underground Railroad through Waukesha. Later, Joshua will end up in Canada as a free man. These actions were part of a chain of events that led to the formation of the Republican Party and the declaration of the end of slavery in the United States, among other things. The nullification of the Fugitive Slave Act would be a big part of it. This event is massive at the time, and the Masons are right in the middle of it. And so, let's get into it. But first, let's take a look at sources. In terms of sources, I've looked at, for example, the minutes of Waukesha Lodge, a couple of our main characters in this story, or members of Waukesha at the time. Waukesha Lodge is fairly new at the time, having uh, just been founded within the previous five to ten years. I'm looking at memoirs from C.C. Olin, I'm looking at Memoirs of Waukesha County, A History of Waukesha County, by a man by the name of Haight uh, from 1907. Also looking at Racine, Bell City of the Lakes, another history. This is a history of Racine by Stone in 1916. Looking at records from the Wisconsin and Waukesha County Historical Society. I'm looking at materials, a lot of primary source materials, kind of capturing the Underground Railroad in general, what it looks like in Waukesha, and different things that are going on at the time. Now, before we get started into the story, there are a few things we have to touch on. First of all, what is the Underground Railroad? The Underground Railroad is a network of people, African American as well as white, offering shelter and aid to escaping enslaved people from the South. It develops as a convergence of several different clandestine efforts. It's really amorphous. It's not really well organized at a large level. Very, very local, and that's why it can keep functioning. If it was a huge national system, well, it would have been easy enough to take out the hierarchy and take out the system. The exact dates of its existence aren't known, but it operates from the late 18th century, around the time of the Revolutionary War, all the way up to the Civil War, at which point its efforts continue to undermine the Confederacy in far less secretive ways. How active was it in Wisconsin? Well, not very. To be honest, Wisconsin is kind of split between abolitionists and people who believe that slavery is perfectly fine, primarily when it's over there, i.e. in the South. 
As enslaved people sought freedom in Canada in the mid 19th, uh, sorry, mid 1800s, some passed through Wisconsin, but not too many passed through Wisconsin. It's much more common to come up through Indiana. It's much more common to go up through parts of Pennsylvania and New York than it is for Wisconsin because we're far to the west when you look at those slave states. We're not necessarily in a nice direct line, but if you're escaping from, say, Missouri, yeah, you're going to come through Wisconsin. Now, the secretive nature of the operation makes it difficult for historians to fully track, but the records we do have show that Wisconsin lent a helping hand to those fleeing slavery in the South, just not a huge helping hand. To give you an idea, Milton House, which is part of that Underground Railroad, probably had between 5 and 15 people come through. We don't have large numbers. Why? Because it wouldn't make sense to do so. It would be really obvious if people keep coming and going from your place that there's something going on there and you're going to call the authorities and you're going to let people know. So typically these movements are happening in a very scattered fashion. You go this route this time, but the next time you would take someone another route so that you're not drawing attention to a single place. Now, why Waukesha? Why is Waukesha at the middle of this? Well, this quote I'm getting from a paper by J.J. Schlichter uh, called The Division Fight in Waukesha County. It says, quote, but Prairieville, which is the previous name for Waukesha, was nevertheless, even in 1846, a place of some note. It was already looked upon as the center of abolition sentiment in the West, and it was an active terminus of the Underground Railroad. Since 1844, a radical anti-slavery newspaper, the American Freeman, had been published there. And incidentally, the newspaper in Waukesha today is the Waukesha Freeman. These sentiments are still very strong in that area. Now, did people settle there because it was abolitionist? Yes, probably. You get a couple of people who are abolitionists and very powerful in town. It brings that spirit in. And if it's a place you feel comfortable, well, then you're going to settle there. And so it makes a lot of sense that you would get more and more people of similar thought into one area. It was known as an abolitionist swamp, an abolitionist stronghold in Wisconsin. So very important town. And to give you an idea of some of the, you know, when we get to Joshua Glover, he's not the only one. There's actually an escape of someone else in 1842, 10 years prior uh, to Joshua Glover. So we see Caroline Quarles escaping. In 1842, a 16-year-old slave girl by the name of Caroline Quarles was brought to Prairieville after escaping her mistress in St. Louis in Missouri. Of course, coming up the Mississippi, you're going to kind of come up into Wisconsin. She gets into uh, Waukesha. Upon arriving, she already had a $300 reward on her head for capture. To give you an idea, multiply that by about 40 to take care of inflation which means we're looking at somewhere around uh, 12000 I may be getting my numbers wrong, but about a $12,000 reward on her head. Huge reward. Imagine if someone came into town with a $12,000 reward on their head today. You'd probably go ahead and try and, you know, get that money if you can. Now, she was escaping to another state or sorry, escaping to another state did not protect her from recapture because legally her owners were able to go to any state to get her back. Her captures were very ser- her captors were very serious about finding her, and at every turn they were pe- there were people looking for. Others joined the search because of the high reward. She was first taken in Wisconsin, in this area near Waukesha, to Ezra Mendel, and then to Lyman Goodnow. Being abolitionists, they wanted to help her escape to Canada where slavery was banned. So she's first driven by wagon to Spring Prairie in Walworth County to some fellow abolitionists because she was tracked to Prairieville and wasn't safe. Lyman and Ezra return home to consider a plan. Eventually, Lyman returned to Spring Prairie to retrieve Caroline and with $20 and a pillowcase full of food, they begin their journey to Canada 500 miles away. Of course, without planes and trains are very uh, in their infancy at the time. This is a very difficult long trip. They will follow the Underground Station or Underground Railroad from station to station, finally arriving in Detroit and then to the Detroit River. Freedom workers hired a ferry, deliver them across to Sandwich, Ontario and Freedom. There, Caroline was left with a pastor. Lyman returns home. 
Caroline had been on the Underground Railroad for a thousand miles. It, this trip takes her about four months from July to October 1842. Now, we do have someone who's tied to Waukesha Lodge by the name of D.A. Clinton. Uh, he will later be potentially tied to the lodge. He is family to other lodge members, including E.C. Clinton. He's the brother-in-law to Lyman Goodnow, the guy who takes Caroline to Canada. And he may have, or it appears he may have, financed the escape from Waukesha to Canada, providing with those $20, which would be about $800 today. Again, a pretty decent sum to give someone, and it shows a certain element of who this person is, who D.A. Clinton is. Now, let's get on to Joshua Glover, because that's what I want to deal with. I've laid out some context. I've laid out sort of what the setting looks like. Now let's get into the characters. Joshua Glover is an escaped Missouri slave. In 1852, he sells in Racine, working at a nearby sawmill. Now, this is not uncommon for a slave to come so far and then go, you know what, I, I think I can settle here. I'm going to work for a while up here in Racine, Waukesha, this sort of corner of southeastern Wisconsin. It's very abolitionist. He knows that people don't really care for slavery in this area, and so he's going to be all right. Now, on the night of March 10, 1854, we see a posse of people, including two federal marshals, Glover's former master, and four other men break into his home and arrest him under the authority of the Fugitive Slave Act. In this conflict that happens in the home, conflict being a very, not the appropriate term for this, in this fight that will break out, he's going to try and, Joshua's going to try and defend himself. Uh, He's struck over the head. He's in pretty bad shape. Now, fearing that Glover could not be successfully detained in the abolitionist enclave of Racine, he will be taken over to Milwaukee. And so he'll be put in the Milwaukee County Jail while awaiting final disposition by a federal judge. Because you need to get a federal judge involved in these cases. So, what happens? The morning turns up. We're into March 11. And... What we see is that Joshua's friends and local sympathizers informed Milwaukee abolitionists and newspaper editor Sherman Booth, who together with abolitionist attorneys made unsuccessful legal attempts to free Glover. They're following the paper trail. They're doing the right thing, filing the motions. At the same time, these individuals aroused the passion of a crowd. Now, this is code. When we say arouse the passion of a crowd, we mean started a pretty decent demonstration. We're talking probably anywhere from 500 to 1,000 to 5,000. At the end of this, we we have about 5,000 people standing outside the Milwaukee County Jail at a time when the population of Milwaukee is much lower. We don't have a million people in the metro area. We have, you know, somewhere around 50,000. And so a pretty decent part of the population is showing up for this. Milwaukee, also very abolitionist at the time. So we get this huge crowd outside the county courthouse to protest Glover's capture. At some point on March 11th, Booth or someone else suggests, hey, we should just break him out. Things are not going our way. So let's just take him. We have 5,000 people. We have lots of tools. What are they going to do? Arrest all of us? You're familiar with this sentiment. You've come across this before. So the mob forcibly enters the jail, frees Glover, and takes him to a safe house in Waukesha. Which we're going to get to Waukesha here in a second. Booth had been a resident of Waukesha before moving to Milwaukee, explaining the connection to one of the next main characters that we're going to come across, Winchell Bacon, as well as John Messenger. So... What's going to happen? Glover is now out of jail. He's bloodied from the conflict the night from the fight the night before. He's shoved into a carriage and sent to Waukesha. Now, this raises some questions. Where'd the carriage come from? Who's driving the carriage? Why is it going to Waukesha? It's going to Waukesha because it's an abolitionist enclave. It's very strong with abolitionists. It's going to a specific place, the home of Winchell Bacon who's going to be aware that it's on its way or appears to be aware that this carriage is going to be on its way. 
And Booth knows to send Joshua off to Waukesha because he's lived there. He probably has those connections. Uh, Booth had been editor of a number of Democratic and abolitionist papers in the area in the 1850s, 1840s and 1850s. So not unusual. Now, the carriage driver is a man by the name of John Messenger. I do not find any connection between Messenger and the Masons, but he's an interesting person. He arrives uh, late at night. Basically, Messenger picks up Joshua Glover, the slave, and runs him out to Waukesha. Now, in a carriage, that's going to take a while because it's a plank road. So, in other words, there's wood planks all along the way. It's not exactly fast via horseback. You know, you're limited in terms of your speed. There are other people who are potentially chasing, and let's not forget that the invention of the telegraph, etc., means that you could potentially, if those lines are there, people could know that you're coming. And even if they don't, they're not that far behind you. A horse with a rider is much faster than a horse with a carriage. And everyone kind of knows where you're going. So it's going to be a problem. So he goes directly to the house of Winchell Bacon who's an abolitionist and happens to be the junior deacon of Waukesha Lodge 37 at the time that this happens. So, Bacon's house is where the Spring City Hotel was at one time located in Waukesha. It was thought best to keep Glover, uh, whose hair is still covered in blood, his clothes are dirty and torn from maltreatment. Uh, They believe that it's best to keep him hidden within Bacon's house, at least for a period of time. Now, this is going to be problematic because there's a huge risk. Under the Fugitive Slave Act, Bacon can be charged, he can go to prison, he can have fines, just incredible fines. It can destroy his life. What he's doing here, the risk that he's taking here, can absolutely destroy him. I mean, he's already committed several felonies simply by allowing this slave into his home. Because he knows he's a fugitive slave. There's no way you can argue this. So Bacon is putting himself out there. Now, who's this Bacon character? Bacon was born in August of 1816. He's born in New York. We see lots of people in this area of Wisconsin coming from northern uh, upstate New York. And then uh, in 1838, he marries his wife. Uh, For a while, they live in New York. And then sometime around 1841, they travel to Wisconsin. Why? Because they're looking for more farmland. They're looking for better opportunity. Keep in mind, no one ever leaves and migrates somewhere because they're doing really well where they are. And so he travels uh, with his wife out west. They come to this place called Prairieville, now Wisconsin, where they settle. Bacon is a hardcore, well-known abolitionist, very active in the Underground Railroad. It was at his home that fugitive slave Joshua Glover will shelter on the first night after being broken out of jail in Milwaukee. Uh, Bacon became active in the Republican Party after it's founded in Wisconsin, publishes the the Waukesha Republican, a campaign newspaper for a period of time. Uh, By 1861, after the outbreak of the Civil War, Bacon goes on to be commissioned by the governor, uh, Governor Randall, also a Mason of Waukesha at the time, to make purchases of military supplies in New York for Wisconsin. Supplies in Wisconsin had been exhausted. A task that he completes on time and under budget. And then in 1863, Bacon is appointed by Abraham Lincoln as paymaster of the United States Army with the rank of Major. So, clearly... He has these connections. Randall is a member of the Lodge, would have also been well aware of what Bacon is doing. Trust me, in a Lodge, everyone kind of knows if someone's up to something, word gets out. We talk like old ladies around a well. It's, it's a thing. Masons do it all the time. Now, here's where things get interesting. Bacon appears to have been burned in effigy in the South and around Waukesha by Southern sympathizers for his involvement. There's no secret that he's involved in this. The Lodge would have been well aware of the fact that he was actually part of this. 
It means that the Lodge knew and either supported or at least condoned his actions, judging from the fact that another member of the Lodge is going to be heavily involved in a minute, I would say they're probably supporting it at some level. <clears throat> we know that Bacon is regularly attending Lodge before these events, and then he disappears for about a month before coming back. According to the minutes, he actually addresses the Lodge on a topic that is unknown. It simply states that Winchell Bacon addressed the Lodge on April 28th. Now, he could be providing Masonic education, and I get that. But he could also very well be sitting there saying, this is what happened. You know, I'm trying to clarify for everyone exactly what happened. I want to let everyone know what's going on and everything else. And by the way... The Lodge clearly is supporting, or at least in favor of what he's doing, because Winchell Bacon will be Worshipful Master uh, two years later. So he moves right up through the chairs. Everyone appears to be supportive of this. And this is not a situation where the Masons made him this man. This is a situation where he's already a good man. And he just happens to fall in with another group of good men, the Masons in Waukesha, at the time. And it strengthens his views. It strengthens his grit and his determination to do what is right. And so he goes through with this, with some help. E.C. Clinton, another member of the Lodge, turns up. He appears to have provided, and by the way, you'll remember I mentioned D.A. Clinton earlier... Uh, so E.C. Clinton is possibly D.A. Clinton's, one of his uh, children or a cousin. They're related. They appear to be related. But he appears to have provided financial backing and may have been part of assuring safety as Glover is moved out of Waukesha. He may have also been among the brothers following Glover to make sure that he had made it to the farm unmolested. Because after we leave the Bacon House, because everyone's going to come to the Bacon House, everyone knows what's going on there. He's well known in the community. He's known as an abolitionist. They know what's going on. This is why it's so risky for him. But they very quickly realize that if everyone's going to be coming there, they should probably move Glover somewhere else. So we come across the Tincher Farm. Now, Vernon Tincher is chosen to act as a guide in conducting Glover to his father's farm, which is south of the town at the time. Uh, Tincher saw several people in the dim light of his father's house, and he thought Glover had been followed, but on looking more closely, he recognizes people such as W.D. Bacon, uh, sorry, yeah, W.D. Bacon, and uh, Holbrook, who's another figure in Waukesha at the time. Some people put Clinton here, uh, E.C. Clinton, but they were kept uh, silently along, basically following behind Glover and following behind Tincher to make sure that they're not followed, that there isn't something else going on. Now, Glover will stay at the Tincher farm until another brother by the name of C.C. Olin has returned from Waukesha and made arrangements to carry him uh, back onto the Underground Railroad sort of officially, where only a few days before he had been captured by U.S. Marshals. So he's taken back to Racine County, right where he's been captured. Not the same place, obviously, but in the same county. So what do we see here? What have we covered? We have a situation where Masons are acting Masonically. They're standing up for what they believe for what would have been at the time potentially a dangerous thought, Bacon is putting himself on the line in a huge way. I mean, he's facing criminal charges. He's facing arrest. He's facing any number of different issues. Uh, he could have been ostracized from the community. He could have been... Uh, destroyed as a businessman because people go, well, I'm not going to do business with someone who's you know, doing these things. And yet, none of those things happen. He becomes the paymaster of the U.S. Army, amongst other things, in part because of connections to the lodge, a lodge that clearly supports what he's doing, or they wouldn't be helping him. He wouldn't become the master of the lodge two years later. He wouldn't get the help of another Mason by the name of Randall. 
the lodge is behind this. So this is not the story of a lodge as such. This is a story of masons putting it all out there and risking everything for their beliefs, basically putting their money where their mouth is. Now, I will do a part two on this where we're going to get Glover out of town and kind of look at a couple of other things. But until then, thank you for joining me, Brother Chris Lidke, and the entire Further Light team on your quest to find more light through masonry. Are you interested in learning more about Freemasonry in Wisconsin? Visit wisconsinmasons.org to learn more about masonry and access further educational content and more light. Once again, that address is wimasons.org. Any questions, comments, or suggestions, please email us at education at wisconsinmasons.org. And thank you for listening.